those worries and everything, let's just set those aside. Let's just concentrate on who God is. And let's just enjoy the service. Let's worship Him the way that He deserves to be worshipped. Amen. Let's go to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, first and foremost. Lord, whether you're uh, moving in our lives or not, we can still consider ourselves blessed and Oh, thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything that you do, Lord. And teach us not to take you for granted. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, as we give back to your kingdom, take it multiplied as only you can, Lord. It's all yours. You were there when it was created through your son, Jesus Christ. For him and through him, for your glory, Lord. So as we just get back to you, we thank you, Lord. We praise you, we honor you, and glorify you because of who you are. And we give your son the thanks. And with a loud heart, praise. Amen. 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 Amen.
and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed, conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. Say that with me. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Wow, what a testimony. Father, thank you today. Thank you for these who gathered in your house. Thank you for these music ministers up here that brought us to that, to that throne of mercy of which we seek grace this morning and help in time of need. We thank you, Lord, as we gather in your presence to worship you. Part of this worship is, is in this word, and I know that you have given it to us that, that you may help us to be better disciples and be a better church. So, Father, help us as we study it. Bring it back to, to us in our hearts. As you did the apostle that day, he sat there in that prison and penned these words for you. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise. And all the people of God said, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Look around, smile, somebody. Yeah, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, you can talk to him too. You can welcome him. Are you coming? Oh, mercy. <laughs> well, if only. I, I call it if only Ias. <laughs> it, it's a, uh, you know, I, I put Ias on the end of things sometimes. But we're going to talk about some regret. I'll talk about regrets, and, and all of us at, at some point or another have had regrets, and maybe still have regrets. That's just that's just part of the human nature. And and one of the things that that hampers our growth in Christ is regrets. Just like just like guilt and just like grudges, regrets are weigh us down. It's like a it's like an anchor, or regret is like an anchor that's stuck somewhere in the past. <laughs> and as we start to move forward, as the song says, we're sailing in troubled times. As we start to move forward, it's just like every now and then that regret will snag, and it will hold us, and it will keep us right at that particular point. And, and that's, that's not a good thing for any of us. And, and that's, not, you know, that's not what God's intention for us going through things is about. So we're going to talk about what, what I call if only itis. And, you know, regrets, we can learn from them or we can let them stifle our joy and, and our growth in Christ. We, we, really, we have to make a choice how we, how we deal with those things. So I think that's what we're going to learn today. Hopefully, by the help of the Holy Spirit from, from the Apostle Paul. Now, that, what I call itis, when I put itis on the end of, of words, that's a medical subject. And what it means is swelling. And it swells. When you got itis, you got pain associated with that. Whether it's pancreatitis or, or whatever it might be, sinusitis. Anytime you got itis attached to the end of a, of a medical term, it's, it's pretty much causing you pain. Well, I, I kind of apply it in a spiritual sense. I, I have said that sometimes I get a case of eye-itis. Yeah. Anybody ever had a case of eye-itis? Yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm going to do that. You know, I start swelling, and, and it doesn't take long before the pain hits, and I realize, uh-oh, we're going to have to we're going to have to do something about this. Well, that's that's why I call it if only itis. I, I can't tell you and, and literally mean that. 
how many people that I've talked to over the years, and especially the job that I did at Dev all of with Charlie and those guys, I can't tell you how many times that people will begin uh, the problems that they're facing at that moment, they will begin by saying, if only. Yep. If only. In, in times I did a lot of grief counseling, I, I taught a lot taught a lot of classes in, in grief counseling. We, we had groups and and, and and all of them would have the same pretty much story. If only. That's how it would that's how it would start out. And I thought about this when I was reading through through this scripture that Paul had written here. It came to my mind about if only. I, you know, I think about it in the sense of the apostle and all that he went through. And we know that Paul, Paul bound to have had guilt. He bound to have had some regrets on his former life based on the fact that Christ literally pulled him out of the fire and made him an apostle for the rest of us. That we can look to, to his witness and see what God is able to do with us by what he did with the Apostle Paul. And we all may think, well, you know, I'm not an Apostle Paul. Yes, you really are. When Christ brought you into his family, he automatically made a witness out of you, whether he wanted it to be or not. And you may not, you may not witness as Paul did, but you are a witness. We are all witnesses wherever he has put us and whoever that we may be a witness to. So in that sense, we can relate to the fact of what our former life was like and what our life is like now in Christ. So let's talk about, let's talk about these if only just a few minutes as far as being regrets. And if only is, as I said, an itis is such a disease or something that affects, that affects the body. The if only itis is a spiritual disease that affects our spirits, and, and it affects our memories. It, it, runs, it runs through our memory in such a way that when we begin to dwell upon that, then it brings back emotional pain, and it can even bring back anger or frustration or, or things that, that might have happened. You know, we, we've all been there. Got a fish hook in my thumb here a few, <laughs> a few months ago. And the first thing I said was, if only I had left it alone. If only I had to reach over in there and grab that thing, it wouldn't have ended up in my thumb. So there's always something associated with an if only that tells us you shouldn't have done or you should have done something different than what you did. And it infects that memory. My memory is infected by that. I pay very close attention to fish hooks now. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I always have, but since that happened just a few months ago, and I've had more of that stuff. Get me, but I forgot it, John. Right. But that brought it back fresh. <laughs> but, you know, and, and if that didn't do it, the ER bill would bring it back fresh to you. But anyway, now I pay closer attention when I'm dealing around those things because I don't want another one, another one in my thumb. So in that sense, the regret I have for getting that hook in my thumb became to me a lesson, a lesson, and when it goes through my memory that my mind is infected with that, it doesn't necessarily bring pain as it did that day, but it brings a reminder of why I need to pay close attention to. So that don't happen again. And regrets don't, don't necessarily have to be bad things. See, the, the pain that a regret can bring can turn into that. And when it comes forth sometimes, it causes us to punish ourselves inside. Now that's what Andy said to Gomer. Remember, he told Gomer, he said, don't go punishing, punishing yourself inside or nothing. <laughs> you ever punish yourself inside? Yep. Yeah, you do. We all do that. We're harder on us sometimes than God is. But we punish ourselves on the inside. Well, regrets can cause us to do that. Regrets can put us in that situation to where we will do that and then we begin to think, how could I have done something like that to cause what it's called? Well, now, here, here's how I am in regards to God. If he's going to show me something 
or if he's going to teach me something, I know it's got to be here. It can't be just something I think about. It can't just be something I make up. It, it can't be just a sermonette. It's got to be a message from the word of the Lord if it's going to do any of us any good, doesn't it? So if, if I have regrets, I know there has to be situations in the history of mankind that God has dealt with that his people have had regrets at some point, and surely they have. The children of Israel had a case of if only items. The children of Israel dealt with that. Here's how we know. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 2, after they received the report from the spies that had went into Canaan, you remember they sent the spies up there, and when they came back and gave them the report, they said, they some big people up there. They, these are descendants of the giants. I don't know if we can take it or not. So in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 2, here's what we read about their case of all the idols. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Huh? If only. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. There's a regret there. There's a regret there. You know what they regretted? They regretted they were still alive. Huh? Ain't that what they regretted? I mean, if you, if you say to God, well, if I only died back in Egypt, what you're saying to God is, if, if only I had died, I wouldn't be alive today. They regretted their life. Can you imagine that? But isn't that how it is? If things don't fit within what we want it to fit into, then, well, if only this. They regretted the fact that they were still alive. If only we had died in Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. Well, guess what happened? God answered that regret. God says, you want to die? I'll let you die. Huh? You better not mess with God. You better not mess with me. Because he has a way sometimes, and I told him about the prodigal, he can give us what we want sometimes. And it may not be what we really want. We just think that's what we want. So this regret of being alive that they had, listen, he brought them out of Egypt for their own good. He brought them out of Egypt for their own good. But because he didn't do everything the way they thought he should do it on their timing and the way it should have been, they said, you, you don't really care about us. Really? He sent all them plagues upon the Egyptians to get them out of there. He brought them through the Red Sea. He actually parted an ocean for them so that they could come through on dry ground. He drowned all the enemies of all those who were after them. And then they got the gall to say to God, ah, if you have just left us in Egypt, we could have died now. He, listen, I'm glad he's merciful, aren't you? Amen. He could have batted an eye, and, and earth would have been gone at that time. But he didn't do that because he knew men's hearts. He knew how we were, and he knew how we thought. See, regrets can do one of two things. They, they, can, they can either become a debilitating enemy for us. It, it can become a debilitating enemy. A regret can stifle you. It can stunt your growth in Christ. It can stop you right where you are, and you'll never get past it, and you'll never attain any more than you already have in that area because of that regret. It can stop you in your tracks. That's what happened with the children of Israel. Their if only stopped them in the wilderness, Charlie. If only we had died in the wilderness, God said that you'll die in the wilderness. Amen. If that's where you want to stop, if that's where you want to remain, then that's where I'll leave you. You can stay there in that part. So they regretted the fact that they were still alive, that God took care of that regret for them. 
So it became a debilitating enemy to them. It didn't really, that regret didn't benefit them. <laughs> it left them in the desert to die. Now, David, David had a case of the only eyes. Uh, he had a case of eyes one time, and even eyes one time. <laughs> but David, <laughs> yeah, baby, but David had a case of eyes. Listen to what David said. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33, we find this. Then the king was deeply moved, and he went up to the chamber over the gate, and he wept. And as he went, listen, as he went, he said thus, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, if only I had died in your place. David had a regret. He had a regret that he was still alive. That's just what he said. If only I had died. He didn't die. If only I had died, he said, in answer. Can you imagine what the world would be like today if David had died and Absalom was left to rule? Yeah. Huh? You go back and read, yeah, you read his history and read the history of David and you try to imagine what what life would be like now in regards to Christ and God if Absalom yep. had been the king to rule the Jews instead of David. I am so glad that nothing that people do can throw God's plan off track. I am so glad that nothing we do or nothing we say or anything we don't do is not going to sidetrack his plan. Because listen, if he gave to us everything we wanted the way we wanted it, you think we're in a mess now. Can you imagine what it would be like if somebody wasn't in control of it for our own good? Amen. And that's why he does what he does. He brought the children out of Egypt for their own good. That's why he brought them out. He let Absalom die for David's own good. You know what would have happened if Absalom had to die? He would have killed David. Yeah. He would have killed David. That was his goal. But it wasn't God's plan. God said, you are the apple of my eye, David. Yep. He protected David. And David was so grieved and David was so hurt that he was willing to regret his life because he was hurt over the fact that his son died. Now, I know that's got to be a terrible hurt. Now, those of you who have lost children, that's got to be a terrible hurt. It's got to be a terrible pain to lose a child. It's got to be. And I'm sure there are people who have said, why not me? Why not me? Why didn't I die instead of a child? i tell you why. Because God has a plan. Yes. It's God's plan. And God plans that which is good for us and not bad for us. He wasn't punishing the children when he brought them out of Egypt. He wasn't punishing David when he let Absalom die. He was doing it for their own good. But now here, here's the difference. The children of Israel allowed their regret to stop them in their tracks and become a debilitating enemy for them that they never progressed or they never went forward from that. But old David, old David's regret showed him something different. See, a regret can either be a debilitating enemy or an empowering teacher. He can teach us something. I just, I just told you that about the fish hook. Uh, you know, that fish hook, I could have quit fishing. I ain't messing with fishing. Sell my money. I'm done with all that stuff. Listen, I ain't had nothing to do with no more fishing because of, that would have been a debilitating enemy. But it become an empowering teacher for me. And that's exactly what happened to David. He regretted he was still alive, but unlike the Israelites, he let that regret teach him something. 
Here's what he learned. Psalm 62 in verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Trust in him at all times. When, when you're more than the loss of your child, trust in him. When, when, you're, when you're in the desert and you're in the wilderness and it doesn't seem like things are turning out okay, trust in him. Pour out your heart before him. Empty it. Empty it before him. Look, he knows what's in there anyway. He knows what we're holding in there. Pour it out, David said. David poured it out. David said, if only I had died instead of my son Absalom. But then David said, but it wasn't your plan, God. It wasn't your plan. I trust in him, he said. God is a refuge for us. He's a refuge for us. You empty our hearts, that's emptying ourselves, and we go to him. We go to him. So, so those regrets, those if only that we have to deal with, we got to pour them out, Charles. You got to pour them out before Him. He knows what they are. He knows what the regrets are. He knows our life from the get go. Before He formed us in the womb, He knew who we were. That's why He told Jeremiah. So I don't see any different for us. So the fact that we have regrets is what we have to bring to Him. Now listen. Our if onlys, if I'm the honest, they come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? And it can differ with age. And it can differ with where we are. Our if onlys. Here's just a few of them. You may have some more. I made a I made a list of my if onlys. If you ain't got them, thank God. If only I had done this, or if only I had not done this. If only I had said this. Or if only I had not said it. If only I had better help. If only I had went to the doctor sooner. If only I had more money. If only I had took that job. If only I had not took that job. If only I had better parents. If only I was a better parent. If only I was born somewhere else. If only I had said I love you. If only I had said or had not said I hate you. If only I were younger. If only I were older. If only I were prettier. If only I was skinnier. If only I was taller. If only I had a talent. If only people liked me. Huh? If only. If only. Not going to change. Not going to change if only the cure for these if onlys is found within an if only. And that if only came from a lady who had suffered with a disease of blood for over 12 years. This lady had suffered. She didn't say if only I went to the doctor. She went to the doctor. She spent her time. She had on doctors. They weren't able to to heal her. But she didn't say, if only the doctor could help me. Look what she said. If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Huh? Not if only I wasn't sick. Not if only I hadn't done this. Not if only I hadn't done that. Not if only I went to the doctor sooner. If only I can touch his Garment, I will be made well. That's the cure for our if onlys. That's the cure for our if onlys. Well, if only I hadn't said this, or if only I, well, it doesn't matter if you did. You see, the thing about it, we can't, we can't go back and turn our if onlys into I did's or I didn't. We can't do that. It's often been said, I don't even heard it said, it would be nice if life had a pause button and maybe even a rewind button. <laughs> that, that we could get yeah, that David, we could that we could stop where we are and rewind and go back a certain point. And then but listen, how do we know that we would do anything different if we did it? How do we know that? Well, because I learned a lesson from that. Yeah. We serve.
certainly did. But if we go back, we may be in the same shape we was before we started. If we don't change something before we go back, we won't have a different outcome. Albert Einstein said, y'all know Albert, <laughs> you know, the, the genius, the guy that discovered relativity, and, and I say discovered it, he didn't invent it, he discovered it, but the genius Albert Einstein, he said, if you do the same thing tomorrow you did today, and you expect a different result, that's insane. <laughs> If you do the same thing tomorrow you did today and you expect a different result, it's insanity. But how many times have I done that? I've got the car and had a dead battery. And I turn that key over to you. Whoa. Get the ground. You know, I don't say, oh, well, I guess I'm going to have to jump it. I turn the switch off, Charlie, and sit there a few minutes. Yep. And I turn it again. Because yes, I'm thinking, now somehow it's going to work right. this time. That's just the human nature. That's the human nature. So in the reality of the regrets we follow, we follow the same line. Well, I know that if I do this or if I do that, this is pretty much what will be the outcome is, but I'll do it different this time. I'll do it a little different than I did the last time, and perhaps it won't end up the same way that it was. If, if that little lady in that crowd that day if she would have stood there and said, you know what, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait until I can catch Jesus at the well. I'm going to wait until I can catch him, you know, as Nicodemus did at night. I'm going to wait until my time is right, and then I will go to him, and then maybe, maybe at that point, he will heal me. But that wasn't in her line of thought. You know what was in her line of thought? I got to get healed some way. I, I got to get this pain to cure up. I got to get this disease, disease cured. And just so happened. It just so happened. How many believe in coincidence? Good, because I was going to rebuke you. <laughs> there is no coincidence. It just so happened Jesus came by. Jesus knew where, where she was. He knew exactly where that woman was. And the route that he went was personally designed to go right by her. What if, what if, if only she had just stood there in the group? How what would her life been like? She may have died from the bleeding. Who knows? Who knows? But she didn't. Her if only was, here he comes. <laughs> here he is. He's here now. And she said, if only I can touch his garment. Well, guess what? She got to. She got to touch his garment. If only. I've heard it preach that she crawled through the crowd because she touched his tassel. Well, the tassels were actually on the shoulders of the garments that they wore. Have you seen these big general uniforms with the big tassels hanging off of their the Jews had tassels that hung off of the shoulders of their garments. So she didn't, she didn't crawl on the ground and touch the bottom. She pressed through the crowd just so she could reach out and touch that tassel, which was hanging off of that garment that he was wearing. She, just, she said, I don't even have to touch him if I can just touch that tassel on his garment. If I can just touch that, little, that one little part, I shall be made well. And when she did that, you know what Jesus did? Stopped right in his tracks. All these people were around him. All of them were needing healing, no doubt. All of them were trying to get his attention. All of them were pressing in on him. This, this one, you know, Jairus had come, the servant had come from Jairus' house. His daughter is dying. His only daughter is dying. And he stopped to take care of this lady who had been sick 12 years. Now, in the medical field, when you talk about triage, you take care of the people that's going to die first, and then you take care of the rest of them. Jesus reversed that. See, God don't do things logically. He don't follow our rules. He's got his own set of rules he follows. He was waiting on that woman to come. 
and she came and she touched she touched that garment and he stopped and he said who touched me now, I like what old Peter Ingo said Peter had to be an Ingo I like what Peter said and I'm going to paraphrase it. If you go back and read it in that chapter of Matthew, Peter said, there's a, and I paraphrase him, there's a thousand people pressing around us. There's people pushing in on us everywhere, pushing and shoving, and you want to know who touched you. <laughs> That's what Peter asked you today. You want to know who touched you. But Jesus said, power went out Amen. from me. You know what? Jesus knew who it was that was going to come and touch him. He knew. He knew she was there. Yeah. Now, now wrap, wrap your mind around that. The day that that woman was born, Jesus knew that this day he would be in that city and she would come at that hour and she would touch him. That's what he made himself available for. Only she could have changed that. But she didn't. She did what she should have done. And when she came and touched him, at that moment, she knew that her healing had took place. Well, what's that teach us? That teaches us that when that regret, when that regret comes back to us, the only cure that we have for that regret is to pour it out at the feet of Jesus and say, if you will, if you will, you can heal me of this regret. And you know what Jesus will say? I can do that. I can do that. I am willing. I am willing to do it. I can heal that if you are willing to let me. If you are willing to let me. That woman could have bled on, but she didn't. If only I touch his garment. So when he gets all if only I hadn't have said this, if only I could come to Jesus with it. If only I hadn't have done that, if only I could come to Jesus with it. We can't. We can't. We bring it to him. He knows it already. He has, he has who touched me. Nobody else in that whole bunch knows who touched him except him and that woman. Listen, he knows who touched him. Don't you ever think for one minute he didn't know who it was. He knew who it was, but he asked for her benefit. He asked for her benefit. Who touched me? And then she said, it was me. I'm the one who touched you. What, what was the deal with that? Because he wanted everybody in that crowd to know what he had done for that woman. Yes, Nobody would have known Charlie had he not said, who touched me? She could have went up there. She could have touched him. She could have been healed. And her and him would have been the only ones that know. But that ain't what Jesus wanted to have. He said, you touched me. He stopped the whole show. <laughs> and she said, and, and then she told, she had to tell the people. And they knew no doubt who she was. And he touched her so that everybody else would know the power. So our regrets, our economies, the, the things that we deal with, we've got to give them to Christ. And listen, he knows what they are. You know, our, our I have or have not, or I should have or I shouldn't have, we can all reconcile those things by just saying, I will, I will come to Jesus. I will pour out my heart before him. I will trust him from this point forward. I will confess all my regrets unto him. I will accept his direction for my life. I will not dwell on my what ifs or on my if onlys any longer. I will trust in him to lead me and guide me from this point forward. I will let him cut the rope to that regret that's got me held where I'm at, Charlie. That's not letting me progress. It won't let me do this. It won't let me do that. Out of fear that it might happen again. Out of fear that this might take place. No, listen. Bring it to him. Let him cut the cord 
that holds it to us. Look, I may remember my past, and I do remember my past, and I will remember my past. Just as the Apostle Paul remembered his past. I'm sure that the Apostle Paul regretted the fact that he stood there that day and held those coats for those men that stoned Stephen. I'm sure he regretted that. I'm sure he regretted the fact that he tried to kill the Christians and tried to snuff them all out in those who were following Christ. I'm sure he regretted that. And I'm sure as he sat in that jail, I'm sure those thoughts came back to his mind. Yes, sir. And I'm sure he said, if only, if only yep. I had believed him at the outside. If only I would have listened to what John the Baptist said. If only, I'm sure those things came back to him. But at that moment, he said, but here's what I do. I forget that which is past, and I press on to that which is ahead of me. And he said, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfected, and I don't claim that I'm perfected. But he said, Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Let me tell you something. When Jesus gets a hold of you, you ain't going to get away as easy as you think you are. It ain't as easy to get away from Christ as you think it is. When he gets a hold on a man's heart, on a person's heart, and someone wants to go off into rebellion, listen, he don't just stand back and say, well, just go and do what you want to do. No, the picture of a good shepherd that lays across the door of the sheep, remember he told that? I am the door of the sheep. The shepherd that lays across that entrance, he don't let wolves in, but he don't let sheep out. Now, this is not what saved, always saved, but here's what it is. When that sheep decides to go out, he doesn't just raise up and say, well, go on out there and get eaten by the wolf. He'll do everything in his power to hold that old sheep. He'll grab it by the back foot and make it pull away from him, Charlie. He don't just give it up, but he'll let it go if it puts up a hard enough fight. Nobody will take you out of God's hand, but don't ever believe that you can't jump out. Okay? But he holds us. He held on to that lady that had the issue of blood. He didn't give up on her. He went by where she was. She said, if I touch his garment, I'll be healed. Yeah, I'll remember my past, but I refuse to dwell in it. Yeah. I refuse to dwell in my past. You know why? Because Christ has given us a future. He has given us a future. And we don't know what it holds, but he but he does. I will look to the cross because the cross is where my cure is for my only itises. My if only itises are cured at that cross. He didn't just die for the sins I committed yesterday. His death covered the sins I commit today, whether they're intentional or unintentional. His death will cover the sins that I'll commit tomorrow, whether it's sins of omission or maybe sins of commission. Does that give me a free license? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why would I do a time to sin and want to live any longer in it? That's not, that's not the license. But it's the fact that I don't have to fear regretfully to live in the future. Paul wasn't afraid. Paul knew. He was sitting in a prison. He knew what following Christ had caused him. He knew what the sacrifice was. But he didn't say, I ain't doing this no more. I ain't doing that no more. No. He said, I press on because I want to lay hold of Christ who has laid hold of me. You realize how bad Jesus wants us in heaven? Think about the cross. Go back and read that story. If you can read the story of the cross, and it doesn't affect you. You need to read it again Amen. and again and again. It, it, when, when you see how bad he wanted us in heaven, shouldn't we want the same thing? If he wants us in heaven that bad, shouldn't we want to be in heaven that bad? If he's willing to do that in order to get us there, shouldn't we be willing to let our regrets go and press forward 
so that, that we will be where he is? Sure we will. I looked at the cross. That's where the cure for it is. It was on my cross. My cross. It was on his cross that he put my yesterdays behind him. He puts my tomorrows in front of me. That's what the cross did. Yeah. The cross was a crossroads. I thank him every day that I am on this side of the cross. I thank him I'm on this side of the cross. He, he could have he, he could have put me on the earth in Jerusalem back during the time that all that was taking place. He, he could have brought me into existence then on the other side of the cross. And I would have been just like all the rest of them there, had never heard the message of the gospel, had no idea who Jesus was. All, uh, all we knew, that all they would have known about crosses is the fact they killed criminals on them. That's all they knew about a cross. Jesus changed everything. I'm glad that I'm on this side Amen. and know that. Yes, and that I was on the other side Amen. and not on the other side. He, he put my regrets behind me and he has heaven ahead of me. So I refuse, I refuse to let the if only itis swell within my spirit. I refuse that to happen. And as I said each week, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. You know, that works. That works. You don't think it works? You, you try it. Jesus whooped the book out on the old devil. <laughs> he, knows, he knows his future. He knows what's ahead of him. And with that regret, well, I wish I'd have done this, or I wish I'd have done that, or I'll... It ain't about wishing it's coming to Christ and saying, I didn't do this, or I did do that, and maybe I should have done this, or maybe, but you know what? That was then, and this is now, and my life is hidden with you in God, and I am going to press on as the Apostle Paul did and leave all that stuff in the dust. Right? That's what he intends for. Why does he intend for us to do that? Because, listen, me and you are a witness to a hurting world out there. That, that world that's out there that doesn't know what we know about Jesus, John, they know about humans. They know we experience the same things they do. And when they see us, well, how do you, how do you deal with this? How do you, we can tell them how we deal with it. Yeah, I've got regrets. Yeah, I, but guess what? I gave them to Christ. I gave them to Christ. You know all that guilt I felt? He took it all, Charlie. Yes, sir. He took it all. You know, that father come back, but I don't have that guilt associated with it. And you know that grudge I held? You know that grudge that I held? I, I, I brought it to him. I brought there it to go. Jesus. And you know what he did with it? He nailed it to the cross. Amen. He said, this is not going to bother you anymore. It's going to be on the cross. I'm taking it to the cross with me. And I don't have to worry about that. And then when I had that regret, Charles, oh, I wish I'd have come to Christ sooner. I wish I would have known him sooner. I wish I'd have become a preacher sooner. You know, when you have all those regrets, my biggest regret was on the events, and I struggled with that for years. I think about the number of people that I was the last person they saw before they left this world, and a lot of them I wasn't a Christian, Charlie. A lot of them left this world, and I was no help to them. And, I, and there's regrets associated with that. But you know what? He took all that. Yeah, and he Lord. said, but that was then. Thank you, Lord. And this is now. Thank you, Lord. This is now. It may have happened then, but it won't happen again. Because this is now. That's what he intends for us to do. We can't, we can't let our past stop us in the desert and kill us where we are. We have to put it behind us and press on to that part, as Paul said. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus this morning, I thank you for these who are here. And sometimes, Lord, I feel like that I have a personal rant <laughs> at times. 
But God, I'm glad that you're able to, to use us, that we might be witnesses to others. And, and it's good, Father, that we know that we're not the only ones who, who go through things. We're not the only ones that have to endure things. But I am so glad that you draw us to the conclusion that it, as, as Billy Graham had said, Lord, as you could give him the inspiration to say, it's not about how we start, it's about how we finish. And that's what we have to understand. So I pray for everyone here in, in, in this building, and those who are watching on Facebook, and those who may pull it up. I'm sure, I'm sure there are plenty of regrets out there, just like I have regrets. But God, just as you took mine, I know that you'll take theirs. I know you will bring them to a place where they can press on and, and press on in that journey as you have laid hold of us so that we lay hold of you. So I pray for them. I come against that old enemy. I come against the devil because I know that, that he's not after us. He's in front of us. He's trying to stop us from getting to where you intend for us to go. So I just pray right now that, that Lord, you just send your Holy Spirit and he would rebuke him and he would stop him in his tracks when he comes against your children. And I'll give you the thanks and the praise and the glory. And that day when we're all together in that kingdom, we will worship you forever and ever. In your name I say it, Jesus. And all the saints will say we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 Bible study.